Welcome everyone to uh, Cloud Foundry Day at the OpenStack Summit. Um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, containerized Cloud Foundry on Magnum. And it's going to be mostly about containerizing Cloud Foundry, and then about getting that particularly onto Magnum. Uh, my name is Jeff Hobbs. I'm a director of engineering in the SUSE Cloud Platforms area, specifically focusing on Cloud Foundry and container technologies. So a little bit about what we'll be going over. One, why are we here? Uh, then just about containerizing Cloud Foundry, using it as a magnum as a base, then putting the Cloud Foundry on top. Then I'll talk a little bit about where our current state is and what we'll be doing in the future. Um, I've set it up so I can talk mostly through this. There's you know, about 35 slides. Um, and then I've got a can demo that we'll get to because unfortunately, the front to back, it doesn't all happen in, in the uh, five minutes I, I claimed that it took uh, earlier today. Um, so first, you know, why are we here? You know, everyone's looking at this. Uh, a lot of people are, are working on their, their application and environment transition from regular data center stuff out to the cloud and their apps moving from physical servers to VMs to containers. And all of this is in the long term, hopefully about microservices um, and improved uh, development process. And I'm at SUSE. Where does SUSE fit into this? Uh, I'll note that you know we'll we'll talk about the whole uh, idea here. We're really only talking about the top right corner where it says Cloud Foundry, but all of these are elements of the SUSE stack. All of these are open source, so all of these elements you can play with. Um, you know, right now, if you want, uh, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about some of them uh, as, as they touch into Cloud Foundry. Containerizing, the obligatory container picture. So uh, first off, who here actually runs a Cloud Foundry installation at, you know, at any level? Okay, so m most. Um, so, Cloud Foundry is usually deployed uh, using Bosch. Um, and in, in, you know, in a very simplistic way, Bosch is a tool chain that tells you basically how to organize all the code for your software so that it can be easily deployed. Uh, the specific aspect, though, is it deploys to VMs, um, where you, know, you look at Cloud Foundry and ever since its very version one uh, instantiation, it had a pretty clear delineation of what the processes were. In fact, many of them you could argue were almost written in a nice 12 factor way. Yet still the standard way in which uh, deployments happen for Cloud Foundry is always to this VM infrastructure. And um, we wanted to deploy stuff to Kubernetes. So that's, we wrote this tool, it's called Fissile. And it basically converts all these Bosch things in, in, a, in the VM-centric Bosch stuff into container-specific implementation so that it can be run on Kubernetes. And which means, you know, Fissile knows how to automatically compile, configure, and run all of Cloud Foundry. Uh, the nice side effect of using Fissile is that it gives you the mechanisms to make your deployment easier also for the end user and allows you to deliver all these compiled bits in the form of images uh, in a much more ready to run fashion. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that. Um, so you know, you're allowed to uh, filter to what the user can really configure rather than the hundreds of things that Bosch gives you that some of these bits are very important to twiddle and others you shouldn't touch. Um, and the images ended up being configured in after Fissile, uh, configured just using environment variables like a 12-factor app would be. Uh, so the other aspect of it is everything that's done here is done in a way that maintains the Cloud Foundry Foundation certification. And you know, I'd, I'd note that uh, here we fish oil, the, the Bosch disintegrator, and a lot of people have looked at it, it's kind of anti-Bosch. Well, it's not really. It's an alternative uh, that actually builds off of a certain state in the Bosch uh, life cycle, the configuration life cycle, and you know, stops where it starts to think VMs and breaks it apart to think 
uh, in, in containers. And it would be great to bring that uh, further back, but I'll just talk more really about where we are now. So uh, first off, why can't we just use Bosch? Well, Bosch is about virtual machines, and that's not what we're, we're targeting. You know, uh, as, as you kind of look around and you look around at the interest level of other people at the, the conference, um, you see that containers are, are more and more interesting and more and more important. And we wanted something for containers um, and container-based workloads. There's nothing about Cloud Foundry itself that prevents you from operating it in a containerized control plane. Uh, but Bosch does not operate that way. Um, and uh, also for science, because you know we like to play with things. So let's get into what, what it is in teasing all these bits apart. Um, so uh, first of all, it's about, it's about separating all the things. Over time, you know, Cloud Foundry, which existed before Bosch did, then sort of Cloud Foundry was chef deployed, and then sort of Bosch came into being, and they became very tightly coupled. Um, Cloud Foundry components are generally composable and have well-defined boundaries and APIs. But ironically, the, those lines between Bosch and Cloud Foundry have become blurred over time as people have become dependent on using Bosch for the deployment of Cloud Foundry. Uh, and the other aspect is that, you know, these, uh, the ERB templates and Monit have become embedded a lot into the, the entire deployment aspect of a Cloud Foundry system. And, you know, we don't like Ruby stuff sitting uh, over in and through the code that has to be used. And these ERB templates also contain control scripts which are basically equivalent to Cloud Foundry templatized code, which are based on those Bosch primitives. Um, they're not always cleanly, the most cleanly written logic, and even some of those class definitions inside Ruby that you know, seeped into the templates over time. Uh, so you know, you've all of a sudden kind of intertwined way too much about deployment and just Cloud Foundry itself that didn't necessarily, that does, it does not necessarily need to be there as we can see, uh, as we will show. Um, this also makes porting to other systems uh, difficult. Now that is a, is a, is a debatable uh, set. We're looking at it at containers and saying the containers have become more portable. Um, but really, we're bringing things up, just uh, abstracting it to another higher level. Um, and the fact that Monit's the, the only service daemon that you can use is undesirable. Uh, and it's, it's a piece that we haven't quite completely teased out of the system yet. Uh, ideally, you would do that in a truly containerized setup. So first off, what is in the container? Uh, we're basically starting from an uh, Ubuntu 14.04 Docker image. And uh, I say this ironically knowing that I am wearing the green shirt. Uh, we actually do it from other uh, from SUSE images as well, but uh, the current uh, certified system is, is Ubuntu-based from Cloud Foundry Heritage. Um, then you basically create your stem cell-like layer on top of it. Uh, this is very similar to exactly the way that, that Bosch is operating. But at this point, then the adding of the packages and jobs happens um, and an entry point where we've now separated out. Uh, has anyone actually dealt with Bosch at the, the template level? On, on for you, oh, you're all lucky. Um, where we have to then, you know, separate those things which happen at a compile time and which happen at at the particular runtime, um, and then you can take what is in that container and decide to deploy it wherever you want. Um, get a little bit more about the building the world. So basically, uh, for this, again, we've taken uh, a certain step, all the Bosch templates to the, the, the Bosch template releases are done. And we then take what uh, happens at build time and separate it from certain runtime aspects. These are actually already separated in the Bosch YAML files where certain things happen at uh, certain parts of the, the life cycle of the system. And we've taken the parts that happen 
that need to happen at runtime and some of the compile time stuff and just moved that forward into container only operation. So basically all the comp uh, compilation is already done when you're ready to run the system. In, in our case, it's uh, it, because it's in the container. Contrary to Bosch, which happens when you use your Bosch director to do your deployments. Um, also, this is all happening in parallel because we're leveraging containers and go to compile everything with pretty much all of the cores on your machine for the creation of these containers. Um, and the, uh, the, it builds in, again, all of the compilation dependencies directly into the container. So those pieces of a Bosch system which say, hey, uh, you have to do this, that, and the other, we're kind of doing the same thing except, except in, rather than the VM, we're removing some uh, aspects. And it's really not that many, you, you know, it, it's, it's not that far from being VM to being container-based aside from a few key assumptions. Uh, and we're just making those separations occur. Um, so that we can have it all cleanly separated compilation when you're compiling in runtime for when you're actually starting up each container instance. Uh, and basically adding in a lot of smart detection of those various dependencies. So even if several Bosch releases with a lot of jobs, uh, have a lot of jobs that you don't care exactly how they're specified, Fissile will correctly only build the things that are required for that particular role manifest. Um, sometimes, you know, some of these other dependencies that don't actually get run in that particular VM slash container uh, end up in there, and Fissile is actually doing a true uh, dependency check to see, okay, I'm only going to work on the things which are important to the jobs. Again, the, the, I would say processes, but it's not broken down to single processes, but to uh, kind of multiple processes that define the job of a Cloud Foundry component. So uh, then before, the, uh, then next is, is going into the assembly line where you have the role manifest, uh, but basically before detailing what all the configuration looks like, let's talk about all that input. Uh, so again, as I mentioned before, we are taking things from the Bosch release uh, manifest format. This is the same format that then uh, Bosch takes as input and sets out to deploy and, and manage the life cycles in its um, in VMs, we're taking that and then running it through Fissile, which will then do the modifications necessary to say, not VMs, containers, because then we put the container on the shelf and pull it off the shelf when we want to do our actual uh, cluster creation. So you could say we're kind of creating a, an extra intermediate step, but that extra intermediate step uh, is is more pre ready to run with a lot of these assumptions that Bosch is asking you to either define or, or not touch, but leaving in there to confuse you uh, with the opinions to be already ready uh, for, for use. So, you know, again, different Bosch releases. This allows us to be, we were building things off of the standard CF release format. Now we're moving to what's the newer CF deployment and these, uh, exist in, in multiple release uh, forms so that you know you can have a routing release and you might have a different garden uh, release depending on how you're doing your Diego, etc. Uh, it just represents some of the composable architecture that's behind the scenes for Cloud Foundry is remains composable in this in this uh, setup. All that gets run through Fissile, as I said, and then you get the Docker images. So a little bit more about the configuration. And so it looks legible there. So the role manifest. This contains a list of all the Docker images that, that we want to build. You can co-locate co more than one job on a Docker image. Uh, and I'll talk about why we might do that in a second. Ideally, again, a job is a, a single or collection of processes that might run on a VM. Here we're running them on a container. It is not single process 
you know, it's unfortunately gone away from being pure 12 factor. Uh, but this is kind of a step potentially in that direction uh, for, for Cloud Foundry uh, component definition. And so you can co-locate more than one uh, job on, a, on an image or, uh, from different Bosch releases even. And in the configuration section, we transform those environment variables to the necessary Bosch properties. So again, the environment will feed into the container that at runtime only defines the necessary runtime Bosch properties you need for those jobs. Um, and the opinions files are essentially Bosch deployment manifests with only the properties section. And they contain basically the defaults for all of the things that, for example, a customer would never need to touch. Um, the dark opinions uh, you know, shown in the bottom right corner is basically a fail safe uh, where we're using it to insert and make sure that it actually uh, erases the defaults on anything that may exist on the, on the system. And you know, then this is basically how it operates. You end up in the running uh, and it executes the hook scripts, hook scripts coming from the, the Bosch side of things uh, that you know, need to execute a runtime. Uh, config in, it's a, basically a, a sub uh, project of Fissile that, takes, that processes all those templates and turns what are a lot of extra properties into only the properties you care about, plus the environment variable management that should be, sorry, all of, the pro, all of the pieces that you care about, plus the environment variables, which should be the only things you really do care about, and makes the runtime uh, environment configured, configured and ready. So then it starts syslog and, and cron, and then monit. Um, I mentioned before, you know, we'd like to get monit out of this uh, system. You know, you could rely really on the container level uh, management of, you know, readiness and things like that. But uh, that would actually then, you'd have to change around the orchestration or, or, or fully change the assumptions of being able to run in bare metal VMs. And that's obviously a larger discussion. So I mentioned this already around config in, but sort of configuration. Um, one of the common complaints in, in Cloud Foundry is, is just how difficult it is to set it up. Uh, there used to be simpler ways, then kind of Cloud Foundry grew and grew, and you know, you, now you can't barely get a system except for having 20 VMs and, and 60 gigabytes of memory. And that is, you know, there, there is Bosch Lite for some sim simplistic version of it. But um, the, there is a lot of configuration going on there. So the Bosch manifests are, are large and troublesome to deal with. And I think that they're not really the most user friendly. It, you know, the, the community would do itself a, a little bit of effort to you know, take some of these efforts and hopefully separate out what are, it's kind of like what we're trying to do is, if you ever worked in one of those uh, properties dialogues and they have the advanced settings, you know, you maybe only have two or three things that you really care about, and then there's the expert mode. Um, that's what we're trying to do with this system, because there's very few things that you really need to touch. In fact, I'd say less than 10% of the Bosch YAML properties that you could be faced with are actually ones that the uh, end user customers generally need to touch. And probably it's less than, than 3% you could do for very simple dev level setups. Um, so config in, uh, exists there to basically augment the, the whole Bosch template uh, setup and you know, provide you know, for other sources of how to draw that configuration together from all of that giant JSON payload and the environment variables uh, th together. Um, and we use some mustache templates to eliminate uh, some of that configuration complexity. Um, a little bit on the configuration. So we looked at this, there's two ways, you know, the layered dynamic and layered static. Uh, the, in the dynamic sense, well, we could have had a console key space and it could have had all this stuff in there. Um, but the, there's a lot of problems, but mostly being slow to run and it's, 
you might have to restart it. It's not necessarily as dynamic as you think. And then it's requiring yet another key value raft process. And you know, when you've set these up plenty of times, you, you, you know that those underlying pieces like console and etcd are probably some of the most complicated uh, pieces to make sure that in your distributed management and everything are set up right. And everything on top of that just tries to work. So we tried to remove that by focusing more on a layered static um, and using environment variables for the user values and having everything else essentially pre-computed and stored in each container. So the only uh, kind of negative of this is that, oh, if you find, oh, well, I actually did really need one of those other uh, values, then you do have to go through actually modify FISAL to say, oh no, or config to say, I need to make sure that this one is user exposed so I can set it in an environment variable, and then you end up rebuilding the world. However, in Bosch, you do the same thing and you rebuild much larger worlds when you have to do that. Um, so all that said, uh, we have the pull requests. Um, and they really focus on, and, and you know, this is them and more, but they really only focus on a few areas. DNS lookup changes, uh, hard-coded values that kind of were these subtle Bosch-isms, and you know, touching slash proc uh, without restraint, which is a VM thing and something you wouldn't do in containers. And we've pretty much made, and most of these are, are all accepted, for removing these VM assumptions and dependencies from the system. Um, and so, you know, for the most part, a lot of this stuff is ready to, to see some of those changes move forward. Um, and so we talk about, uh, so, you know, uh, you can see the FISAL project, it's actually open source, it's on the SUSE GitHub. Um, there's another side project of this called CF Solo. And I mentioned before that you could actually co-locate more than one job in a container. And this is basically taking uh, Fissile to the extreme of doing all of the configuration changes, the Bosch configuration simplification, but co-locating all of those jobs onto one single Docker container. And uh, that's what the, the CF Solo does. Yeah, it's one really fat container, but it's, it's much thinner than all of the VMs that you might otherwise see. Um, and that's what uh, CF Solar represents. However, it's not just about the uh, uh, container side. Here we're at the OpenStack conference. So let's enter OpenStack and uh, Magnum. Um, so as you saw most of the stuff before, let's just, hey, well, let's get to containers. And I could run that actually on a machine that only had, you know, Docker daemon running and, you know, kind of simple. Uh, obviously, it's not going to get me anywhere into some sort of production scale. So we've been looking mostly at Kubernetes. I mentioned before, that's what our target was. And that's what we're trying uh, from, you know, a kind of a corporate perspective to, to raise it up so that Cloud Foundry could be retargetable in that sense. And Magnum is one of those areas. Uh, so really, how does it work? Um, well, you get a little duct tape and you get a little bailing wire and then you're gonna have uh, a system that works um, because <laughs> it's not always that easy, it seems. Um, so first off, what do we start with? Uh, OpenStack, our OpenStack base is uh, SUSE OpenStack Cloud 7, uh, SUSE, which actually has Magnum as one of the, the core components. I'm not gonna go too much into that one. If you wanna see more about that, I, I believe there's other talks going on. Um, I, in fact, I know there's other talks going on this week from the guys who on, the, on our OpenStack Cloud side on that. It is based on Upstream Newton, in case you're curious and does include the Kubernetes as a service. The Kubernetes here used in this demonstration is 153 and the Docker was 112. Um, so, uh, then enter Magnum. And um, I say this all in about in a few slides to, to make it look easy. It's not quite as easy because I'll get to the quirks in a little bit. 
But basically, we're using a Magnum heat template with some DNS server added onto it. Uh, it's important that you choose the appropriate OpenStack flavor and the Docker volume size so that you know, your, your cluster you know, and can adjust um, as necessary. Uh, and and the, this little command is pretty much all we used on top of a stock uh, SOC 7 system. Um, oh, well, there's a couple of other things that preceded that command. One, you want to grab your, uh, your SUSE Linux Enterprise or you pick your other one, but something that has a Kubernetes enabled image, uh, upload it to Glance. So Glance, image add, blah, 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 blah. Um, the Elbaz side is not strictly necessary, but if you're going to do anything with public IP exposure, then you'll uh, need that. And then make the requisite local DNS uh, corrections. And that is then the command which would kick it off uh, from essentially the, this is creating that, that cluster template. So uh, we've created a template. Now let's create a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so you choose that previously created cluster template, and that was in the previous slide, uh, which was whatever name I gave it, I'd already forgotten. And, um, and then you give it a number of master nodes and kind of adjust this command as necessary. It's the command line version. I'll show you through a, a demo uh, in, in a second. Um, so uh, I make it sound like it's that easy. Well. <laughs> It gets to be that easy after you get to, after you rebuild your cluster about 10 times, uh, figuring out what you didn't do correctly along the way. Um, so we did have to do that ourselves. Some of these were kernel options fixes, uh, mostly because in Cloud Foundry, depending on what you're doing, certain things are sensitive to what's available in the kernel. So we had to make sure that we were setting everything up right. We had chosen the wrong flavor for core nodes uh, because we needed a larger root volume, or rather, we need good volume management, and uh, we just chose to use something with faster core disk rather than slow volumes. Now, this is not a statement on you know, what OpenStack configurations you may need. It happens to do mostly with, we were doing this with uh, kind of desks, uh, so machines sitting under desks, not next connected to the things like fiber channel arrays and all sorts of lovely other stuff. Um, you, you could use volume management if it had the right level of uh, IOPS in it. Um, we did also stick with device mapper. We were trying to use overlay FS, but um, again, it, 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 the configurations were not available to us in the particular OpenStack setups that we the restricted hardware uh, uh, that we were using for the OpenStack setups. Um, another thing is that in this particular case, Magnum isn't really configuring Flannel correctly for etcd, and it didn't do the, the master write for kubelets. Um, you know, we had to change some stuff in the etsy Kubernetes D, and etsy Kubernetes configs to address this. So while it might have worked and you would have said, if you use Magnum and says, I am kind of ready, it wasn't ready for Cloud Foundry, uh, which is itself sort of a, a large and complex workload wanting to run its own distributed uh, configuration management and other stuff on top. Uh, we also required the host path provisioner because um, Cinder, again, was not attaching. Again, I th we're pretty sure this was mostly limited to our hardware. If anyone would like to loan us some more hardware, then uh, I'm sure we'd get around all these problems. Um, Kubernetes uh, DNS configuration changes also had to be added for a service network because we needed a service network for the monster service we were about to drop on top of it. And the one other thing is um, TLS wasn't configured, and this was all our fault because we were using self-signed certs and we didn't want to have to deal with all the, that stuff. Um, so I'm going to say sprinkle a cube of salt here. That's actually it's showing it's working, but I'm going to jump now to that did not show where I thought it was going to show. Um, this is a uh, time compressed demo. 
And um, I'm not mirroring my screen here, so I'm going to look this way. Uh, sorry. So basically, this is the setting up the cube on OpenStack. You're going through the creation of the cluster template. As I mentioned before, this is the command line was shown in the slide. Uh, this is about picking your image flavor, picking a key pair, all the usual stuff. You can actually all do this from the uh, SOC 7 interface. And it's going to, oh, let me get that out of the way. Jump that out of the way. So we've created the cluster type. And it's showing that there it is created. I guess I said this is, uh, it's not that complicated as you're going through all this. Um, the link to the YouTube there is there uh, that you can kind of pause and go through it. But again, this is the creating of the cluster. That was the second command line that I showed. We pick a couple of nodes. And I'm basically compressing. I, we were trying to do this as a live demo, but then realized that that was not going to happen. So uh, also, especially the time it takes to download all the images that you, when you go through building this. But we're showing the, uh, that was the cluster creation. And we have our Kubernetes that was set up on a three nodes. So OK, three node Kubernetes. Uh, and they're now ready. Um, and so uh, next, we're going to basically go into the, the DNS, as I mentioned. This is just some of those weird configuration items got to have DNS working. Um, it, you know, it was one of those quirks. Uh, and especially between the configurations expected between uh, OpenStack itself, Kubernetes, and Cloud Foundry, you have to make them all consistent. And they all kind of disagree on, on where that might, the DNS configs might say by default. So here we're just basically setting up, uh, exposing our port so we can set up the cube dash. And then we have a tunnel. To get, ooh, it's going pretty fast. Now let's uh, gonna pause that. And back to the slides. Um, and let's talk about uh, the Cloud Foundry uh, piece. Um, so Cloud Foundry on top. Uh, so I, I basically compressed what was probably about, it's kind of 20 to 30 minutes of getting you know, in the system that has to get the images. And, and then it runs uh, everything up to the stable ready state. And I took a pause. And we're going to say, OK, well, now we need Cloud Foundry. Uh, Cloud Foundry is itself quite a, a large and, and complex system. Um, but uh, aside from going through and learning what some of those other uh, configuration quirks were, the, 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 the two minutes compressed there does represent a, oh, you know, I've got and set up, and I now have a Kubernetes cluster that is ready to take Cloud Foundry without any other um, confusion or sleight of hand going on. Um, so most of the things were uh, related to service discovery and DNS. Uh, the, there's this assumption for cluster.local being your default uh, discovery domain. And, but Magnum imposes something else. And then you know, who, who are you going to impose the configuration on? Uh, at this point, we're kind of adjusting things by hand in YAML files. I think if you were to harden this, you would make sure to really focus on uh, a better kind of end-to-end -end configuration control for these things. There was also some Kubernetes namespace assumptions that we had to change. And, um, and it basically represented more stuff that we needed to make configurable. So going back to here, let's get into that. What is that Cloud Foundry setup? Um, and first, we're going to set up the UAA. For those who you know, know Cloud Foundry, it's kind of uh, in an automated configuration, this might all look like it's one step, but you really have to have your user auth and authentication all set up. And making sure that it's talking to the right things um, from a service discovery perspective first. You have to have UAA knowing that it's talking to the right services. And then Cloud Foundry will uh, need to find that as its first piece. So here we are setting now up UAA. And as you see the uh, time clicking away at the top, which is why we've compressed this. It does take a little bit to get that all up. Um, and it showed about five minutes. Now we're basically just going to, we, we knew what our, uh, 
we knew what our uh, internal IP was, now we need to expose that. And this is basically the, the dependency chain that you get through. Again, this could be completely automated uh, as, it, as it has been before, but now we are showing that it's up and it's working. We were able to ping it. So uh, now we have UAA, we can go in and distribute the, or deploy the rest of uh, Cloud Foundry, create the namespace for it in Kubernetes, and then we basically have this configuration file, which is all the fissile generated configuration, and that was pretty much it. Again, this is slightly compressed in, in time and in that it's operating, but this is also assuming that you've already downloaded the images and um, so that, because there's probably 30 gigabytes worth of images across these things. There's a lot of layer sharing if you happen to do it right, but uh, it can take a while to, to download. Um, and basically, we're seeing that the readiness probes and liveliness probes uh, are, are being used properly in the system of, and it, it's all then getting set up. Everything from you know, API, Diego, the routing, and the uh, other bits are all on there. It takes about, again, five minutes till they've all come to ready state, and that's done. So um, now everything post-deployment's done, and we're gonna expose it. This is locally, so we've gotta go ahead and get the, uh, the right uh, IP address. We're gonna look at the dashboard, and again, this is the, the Kubernetes dashboard that was set up via uh, earlier and just running all on Magnum. Now we see everything that's running and done. Um, and just a sec. Uh, so now we're just going to look inside a container just to see. Okay, this is actually a Diego so running, um, and we can see that everything is 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 operating properly. Uh, then the next thing is well, okay, now we've got that was that was kind of it. Um, and again, it's only time compressed. There was no cheating going on. Uh, you can run those things straight from those Docker containers. Uh, we only had to make some slight changes uh, on the ones that we'd otherwise had published before for some of these Magnum quirks. Uh, and then you can go ahead and deploy something on this Cloud Foundry. Um, and so let's use it. Uh, we're going to target the, the system. It's on our CF solo setup. Uh, um, and OK, we are actually pointing to the right thing. That was what that was, call was doing, login. And create our orgs. This is all the usual Cloud Foundry stuff. Nothing, nothing, uh, nothing too interesting here. We're only uh, more pointing out that we're now pushing uh, both the Docker app, and as well as uh, a build pack oriented app. So this is the usual Cloud Foundry stuff. And waiting, waiting, the usual Cloud Foundry push, and everything's running. So that's pretty much it, uh, saying that it works. Um, now back to the slides. So uh, where are we currently? Uh, the current working state, Magnum, duh, we saw that. Uh, we also have this running on uh, Google Container Engine, Minikube, Hypercube, and SUSE CASP. Um, if you might not have heard about that, that's a relatively recent project from SUSE container as a service platform. It's Kubernetes, uh, in, although instead of, so there's SUSE OpenStack Cloud and Magnum running on that, there is SUSE CASP, which is a Kubernetes system that can do, for example, pure bare metal Kubernetes. Um, our intention is basically to be running on any Kubernetes system 1.5 or up. Um, oh, and one note that you know, for those of you who may be playing with Cloud Foundry in general, we did have to make some changes. We're using the Groot FS, which is not currently a mainline feature. It's an extra optional feature, but it's the one that allows you to avoid using AUFS in your system. 
And this was very important aspect of being able to run on other Kubernetes where you can't touch the kernel where, because you would have to otherwise install the AUFS kernel mod to allow that. The GrootFS uh, is uh, an effort um, from the core team to uh, use other things, overlay or, or butterfs. And, um, and overlay wasn't working for us, but the butterfs was. Um, yeah, and the hypercube, we've only deprecated that effort because it seems that minikube seems to be better uh, supported inside the community. So a bit about the current development state. Uh, GrootFS, again, to alleviate the, the AUFS uh, current CF requirement, and service discovery configuration improvements that we had to make inside the system uh, that we are now sort of pushing back right into the, the facade and config and level. And also that kind of touches on how you're setting up your Kubernetes. Uh, we do want to be leveraging more Kubernetes features. So the ones that are not italicized are the ones, the, the first four are already in use at some level. Uh, so this is another advantage uh, from going to the containers and container platforms for running Cloud Foundry on is that we're able to use things like readiness and liveness probes. Ideally, we'd be able to get rid of the whole use of Monit and, and further reduce some of the, the overweightness that has, been, that has come into Cloud Foundry over time by leveraging some of these external platform uh, features. Uh, stateful sets, because they're a very important uh, part of Cloud Foundry, there is state involved. Uh, the deployments of Kubernetes storage, Kubernetes storage classes. The three things that we're not using that we want to be in the future are uh, the concept of critical pods so that you, know, you could be tagging certain things for higher level of uh, uh, importance. Uh, pod affinity, because it can be very important to make sure you know, some of your routing stuff doesn't get confused with some of your uh, CPU bound stuff and, and just to generally uh, assert that and more of the network security sandboxing. Uh, in addition, uh, Helm is something that we're, we're looking at. We've been playing around with charts and have some things deploying via charts, but not the entire system. So a little more about uh, where we go from here. Um, as many of you know, SUSE has been extending its community presence and basically growing contribution in many other open source communities. It's obviously long been in the Linux community as it's the first uh, enterprise Linux uh, offering and followed up in, in OpenStack. But it recently joined the Cloud Foundry Foundation board in just, just last December and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation just uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, if you're interested in the Kubernetes efforts, as I mentioned, that's in the SUSE CAS product, uh, which is already currently in alpha uh, beta, beta now. Um, and basically founding members of other new projects. So this is SUSE branching out to uh, other areas. So I mentioned this slide before and I said, ah, you can catch all of this stuff and, and see where it is. Well, I highlight Cloud Foundry again because that's the one piece you're not gonna find everything for today. Um, and uh, whereas everything else is full open, you can find it where, uh, as release stuff. Why is that? Um, for those who uh, weren't aware, the, uh, the source code assets and team, uh, such as myself, were just recently acquired from, from uh, HPE's Staccato Group. Um, so I'm, I'm one month shy, uh, so one day shy of two months at, at SUSE. And um, while HPE can be great about many things, uh, open sourcing its software is not really one of them. Um, but SUSE is very much an open, open source company and we're now going through that process with a lot of the stuff that we built. Uh, so Staccato was this full batteries included platform of everything, mostly closed source. We're basically taking the time now to piece all these things out. So, you know, Kubernetes control plane, Cloud Foundry, Service Manager, et cetera. Uh, we're splitting all these pieces. They will all become open. Uh, the first two things actually was that, you know, that, that FISOL and CF Solo from the Cloud Foundry bits. Um, uh, but more will be coming in the future. So everything you see, for the most part, actually is in the FISOL and CF Solo, uh, but there will be more coming in the very near future, and all of it will be in the open. 
Um, in terms of the next steps for uh, features otherwise, it's hardening the ability to target any Kubernetes deployment. Um, a lot of this is mostly around things like service discovery configuration and other setup. Uh, leveraging Helm charts uh, throughout, as well as other extended Kubernetes features that I mentioned before, things like critical pods, pod affinity, and such. And again, leveraging some more of the new Cloud Foundry efforts, as well as contributing old ones that had been developed uh, previously at, at HPE and ActiveState that just never made their way open source. Things like application versioning, application single sign on, and backup and restore functionality uh, that we built over time in my team that just never got open sourced. Um, and the last one is uh, an interesting side project that we had along with this, which is called Furnace. Basically, it swaps out Diego for direct Kubernetes access so that you could be running, you know, why run uh, containers in containers? That's exactly how Diego operates. There's, and when you have an entire container control plane underneath you, it's not necessary. Basically, it's an experiment that we've proved it's possible, but uh, you know, right now we'll probably want to focus more on breaking some of the Boschisms and bringing Cloud Foundry back to be a true uh, you know, con component 12 factor app type system, and then we'll address some of the other aspects. And with that, I say thank you. Were you uh, curious on that? Uh, it's all recorded though, so. Should be able to catch that anytime. Um, any questions? So I realize I'm spot on time and somebody is going to follow. So you can always ask me later. Please step up to the mic if you'd like to ask uh, a question. Otherwise, I am generally around. One quick question. I realize we're holding up uh, somebody else. Um, so can you just? Describe a little bit the Helm aspect of this. Just amplify that for me, please. Um, so uh, one thing is that it, if we can truly bring Cloud Foundry right to that uh, containerized control plane uh, nirvana, as it were, and be easily to install, then it should be able to install via a Helm chart by itself. Now, the part that I haven't got into, well, there's this entire service ecosystem that can go along with Cloud Foundry. And that can uh, go along with the Cloud Foundry service brokers, as was mentioned in Christian's talk before, and some other uh, things. Now, if those are deployed via Helm, or how you interact with those is an entire open space, and one that we're just currently looking into and haven't made any kind of hard commitments. But we do know that Helm does seem to be the current package manager of choice with growing interest inside the Kubernetes ecosystem. So if we're going to work there, we're going to work with Helm as well. All right. Thanks. I'll let the uh, next person come up. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>